Welcome to chapter five in pathology, which is musculoskeletal pathologies, disorders, and injuries, which means we will be looking at disorders of the muscular and skeletal system. We will be talking about spinal deviations first. Of course, there are normal curvatures of the human spine, kyphosis, in the thoracic spine and lordosis that you see in the cervical and lumbar spinal regions. But in this particular case, the deviations we're going to be discussing are hyperkyphosis, hyperlordosis, and scoliosis. Hyper, of course, means anything that is excessive, beyond, overboard. So this is not a normal curvature, it is an extra curvature, something that is dramatic and is a disorder of the spine. Lordosis, kyphosis, and scoliosis refer to curvatures of the spine. Lordosis refers to the normal inward curvatures of the spine at the cervical and lumbar regions, while kyphosis refers to the normal outward curvature of the spine, specifically at the thoracic region. These terms get used interchangeably with hyperlordosis and hyperkyphosis, which means that the curves look abnormally pronounced. Finally, there's scoliosis, which always refers to the abnormal sideways curvatures of the spine. Now, the bony spine is made of vertebral bones, and there are intervertebral discs that sit between adjacent vertebrae. The spine is made of 33 vertebrae, which can be divided into five regions. The cervical region has seven vertebrae, the thoracic region has 12, the lumbar region has five, the sacral region has five as well, and the small tail-like coccygeal region is made up of four fused vertebrae. Normally, the cervical and the lumbar spines slightly curve inward. This results from the fact that the intervertebral discs in these two regions are thicker anteriorly than posteriorly, which causes this part of the spine to lean forward. On the other hand, the thoracic and the sacral spines are normally curved backward, which is normal kyphosis. Lordosis and kyphosis are typically associated with underlying conditions. For example, in osteoporosis, the bones become porous and weak, and can develop compression fractures causing the bones to collapse a little bit. This can cause a spinal deformity, and can also impinge on nearby nerves. Misaligned vertebrae can also exert too much pressure on the intervertebral discs, causing them to degenerate. Other conditions like spondylolisthesis, in which a vertebrae slips out of its normal position, or conditions like Ehler-Danlos syndrome and Marfan syndrome, where bones and connective tissues overgrow, causing spinal instability. Obesity can also put excess unbalanced weight on the spine, causing it to deform. Other causes include inflammation of the intervertebral discs, which can happen from overuse due to a sports injury, or lifting weights in an inappropriate way. Lordosis typically affects the lumbar region and can specifically result from the trunk flexors and the hip extensors becoming too weak to balance the action of trunk extensors and hip flexors. When that happens, the lumbar spine gets overextended, causing it to progressively curve inwards, causing lumbar lordosis. Lordosis results in an incurved back in the cervical or lumbar spine. Kyphosis mainly affects the thoracic spine, it usually occurs when the front of the thoracic vertebrae gets deformed or crushed, causing this part of the spine to excessively bend forward. Kyphosis typically results in a rounded back in the thoracic spine, which looks like a hump in the upper back. There are a few types of kyphosis. First, there's postural kyphosis, which arises from repeated poor posture, like slouching for a long time. Postural kyphosis is most common in young females. Second, there's Scheuermann's kyphosis, which is when the vertebrae get structurally deformed and become wedge-shaped for an unclear reason. This is often associated with scoliosis, and it's referred to as kyphoscoliosis. Lastly, there's congenital kyphosis, which develops when the vertebrae get deformed during fetal development, 
resulting in a baby that's born with kyphosis. In general, if the condition is severe, it can reduce the space in the thoracic cavity, which can compress the heart and prevent the lungs from fully expanding. Finally, there's scoliosis, which is when the spine becomes twisted or develops a sideways curve, resembling an S or a C shape, often resulting in uneven shoulders and hips. The majority of the time, the underlying cause is unclear, and it's thought that it may be due to a defect in the composition of the intervertebral discs. These discs have a reduced amount of glycosaminoglycans, which changes their ability to act as shock absorbers, and causes the spine to become misshapen. Scoliosis is often seen in individuals with neuromuscular disorders that cause progressive muscle weakness, like cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy. In severe scoliosis, there can be a deformity in the chest cavity, compressing the heart and the lungs similar to what's seen in severe kyphosis. In terms of symptoms, spine deformities can cause mild to severe pain, and the stiffened spine can make it difficult to move. In severe kyphosis and scoliosis, the small thoracic cavity can lead to shortness of breath and an inability to exercise. The diagnoses for lordosis, kyphosis, and scoliosis are done by physical examination of the back. To figure out the extent of the spinal deformity, the Cobb angle can be measured. That's the measurement between two lines drawn perpendicular to the upper border of the uppermost vertebra and the lower border of the lowest vertebra involved in the curvature. In addition, radiographs of the back can be taken as well. Treatment of lordosis, kyphosis, and scoliosis typically includes physical exercises to limit the disease progression and maintain the range of motion, as well as pain medication when it's needed. For children and young adolescents, fixing braces can sometimes help prevent further spinal deformity. In rare situations, surgery may be needed. All right, as a quick recap. Lordosis and kyphosis are usually secondary to diseases or injuries which deform the vertebrae and ligaments, such as vertebral fractures, spondylolisthesis, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and Marfan syndrome. Scoliosis is linked with some neuromuscular disorders like cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy. In severe cases, lordosis, kyphosis, and scoliosis can cause back pain and kyphosis and scoliosis may deform the chest, resulting in shortness of breath and cardiac failure. Treatment usually involves physical exercises, braces, and pain medication, or surgery in severe cases. So that video does a pretty good job explaining the basic differences between the different spinal deviations. Of course, there is also kyphoscoliosis if you win the lottery and get a combination of hyperkyphosis and scoliosis, and kypholordosis, which is a combination of hyperkyphosis and hyperlordosis. Of course, when you are massaging anyone with hyperkyphosis, you're going to position them for comfort. You really need to pay attention to cervical spinal placement and positioning so you're going to look at possible extra neck pillows while they are supine to keep their head elevated and not dropping towards the table uncomfortably or when they are sidelined because their neck will be uh, quite a bit up from the table as compared to someone who is not experiencing this hyperkyphosis. You are absolutely going to massage and lengthen all of the anterior muscles like pectoralis, major and minor. You're going to do um, some tightening work for rhomboids and some of the back and side muscles like serratus anterior, trapezius. You are going to avoid tractioning or any passive range of motion. That's what this PROM means. P-R-O-M is our abbreviation for passive range of motion on the thoracic spine and all affected nearby joints. You need to factor in coexisting conditions as well. 
Um, a lot of times you will see hyperkyphosis in older women. It's also called a dowager's hump sometimes. And they are very prone to having osteoporosis and arthritis. Hyperlordosis, um, as we learned in the video, is an exaggeration of the anterior lumbar curvature, which means it increases your anterior pelvic tilt. So the common cause is postural compensation. Um, you know, if you've got a beer belly or you've had twins or multiple pregnancies, or if you're significantly overweight, if you're obese or morbidly obese, that excess abdominal weight and girth is pulling you forward, which drags your back forward as well. Your back is the back of your front, right? Wherever the front goes, your back also goes. And you can get this exaggerated lumbar curve. So when massaging someone with hyperlordosis, you really want to pay attention to positioning for comfort, especially when they're in the supine position. You want to put a large bolster. Of course, your book PowerPoint here says eight inches. If you have a very tall or very large client, that could easily be two times larger for a bolster. If it's a very small client who has this curvature due to other reasons, um, say it's a very petite person, you might be looking at a smaller bolster as well. But the act of putting that bolster underneath the knees helps to flatten that spine comfortably, whereas they are not being forced into this hyperlordotic arch when laying on their back on your table. When they are laying prone, the PowerPoint suggests putting a pillow under the abdomen. This is fine, unless of course your client is pregnant, you're not going to be laying them prone. Um, if this is someone who has excessive hernias, you're most likely not going to be laying them prone. And if they are comfortable with doing that, you won't be placing pillows there to push upwards. If this is someone who is morbidly obese or someone has a very large beer belly or some other type of large abdominal cavity, they are already most likely pushing their back in the proper position laying prone and you will not necessarily need that pillow. However, using a pillow or using any type of curved bolster underneath the abdominal region will help stretch that hyperlordotic curve and give them a way to sort of pull that vertebrae apart naturally, like it's fighting against all the gravity dragging down the weight of their upper body. But if they are used to being exceptionally tight in this region, putting too much of a bolster underneath the abdomen will stretch it excessively. And more than five minutes of that will start to cause extreme pain in your client. So definitely pay attention to how they feel and if they are comfortable with anything underneath their abdomen when they are prone. Of course, you're gonna massage the QL, the quadratus lumborum. You know that that's going to be tight. The paraspinal muscles, the gluteal muscles, um, the quads, yes, uh, but not so much as the hamstrings. The hamstrings and the calves are going to be involved for sure. They're holding upright. They're trying to balance. Any muscles involved with balancing or keeping that mid portion of the body upright is going to be involved and most likely tightened. You're going to avoid traction of the lumbar spine and you're going to avoid passive range of motion to the affected area. Also all of the nearby joints, which means you're going to avoid doing passive range of motion on the hips as well. Um, a lot of times people with hyperlordosis have issues um, with sciatica. So you are definitely going to want to massage the soft tissues like piriformis, but you're not going to want to do a lot of movement in the hip joint itself. You also need to factor in coexisting conditions, of course, such as pregnancy, osteoporosis, and spondylolisthesis. Um, spondylolisthesis we will cover shortly. It is definitely something that you need to watch out for with people with hyperlordosis. Scoliosis, it is a lateral curvature in the normally straight vertical line of the spine. Um, you usually see it in the thoracic region, that is where it is most evident. 
Children are usually screened in America in elementary and secondary schools. Very often pediatricians, when you do your annual well check on your children, their annual physical review, they will scan for scoliosis as well. Um, if it's a serious case, it might require bracing or spinal fusion. I have uh, worked on multiple clients with metal rods in their back to help stabilize it somewhat so it doesn't go too far to one side or the other and cause a collapse or further impingement of the nerves. As you can see in this x-ray, um, this is what it looks like in the human body and I like to remind everyone you can think of scoliosis as starting with an S and that is most frequently the shape of the spine with this condition. Scoliosis is sort of fun to treat, um, not fun to have, but as a therapist working on a client with scoliosis, you really will have to experiment with pillows and bolstering to find a comfortable position for your client. And you will avoid traction and passive range of motion with the thoracic spine and the nearby joints. And of course, factoring coexisting conditions, osteoporosis, etc. Um, but the fun part comes in when you are trying to figure out how to massage the back muscles. And you want to pay attention to lengthening the back muscles in areas where the spine is curved and the affected musculature is shortened. And you want to do shortening techniques like cross fiber friction and trigger point therapy on areas where the back muscles are overstretched because it is curving away from the area and pulling them further apart. So this is sort of like a jigsaw of modalities on someone with scoliosis on their back, rather than a cohesive treatment that you would normally give to someone with a straight and vertical spine. In this one, you do need to pay attention to lengthening and shortening modalities while offering the client the best relaxing experience that you can. Now we're going to dive into part one of the musculoskeletal pathologies and disorders, starting with osteoporosis. I do have a few videos um, on these conditions, but again, please always refer to your full PowerPoint for quick notes out of your book. Also pay attention to your chapter and all ABMP quizzes on the musculoskeletal pathologies and disorders that we are covering. Our skeleton supports our muscles, ligaments and nerves. It also protects our organs, but it is much more than just a scaffold. It is a living organ that is very dynamic. It is designed to absorb impact and can flex and stretch as we move. It grows with us, changing and adapting in response to various situations, such as during times of different nutritional needs or after an injury where bones may need to repair. And it also decays with us. We could better understand the impact of our bones on our health and well-being if we could get deep inside a bone and see the rigid structure that gives bones their shape and to watch the microscopic changes that happen in response to different situations. Inside our bones you would see a dynamic and crowded space packed with many different types of cells, each with an individual role, but working together to keep you healthy. Some cells here in the bone marrow divide and enter the blood circulation to become red blood cells. Others mature from stem cells to become part of the immune system. You can see the bone structure itself is made up of a calcified matrix. This is made up of collagen and minerals the cells that form part of the bone matrix are called osteocytes. On the surface of the bone, you can see two main types of cells that constantly work together in a delicate balance to remodel and repair bone. Here you can see the osteoclasts resorbing bone. These cells work together 
with osteoblasts that can be seen here building new bone. During growth and development, more bone is built than is resorbed, allowing our bones to lengthen and strengthen. But this relies on adequate weight-bearing exercise and appropriate nutrition. It is only up to about 30 years of age that we can increase the strength and density of our bones. After this time, our bones start to decay. This means that bones that do not experience enough exercise and do not receive enough calcium and vitamin D during the critical years are less dense, weaker and more likely to develop osteoporosis and fracture. There are some medications that can help manage osteoporosis and researchers are working hard to find ways to reverse the biological bone clock and to prevent and treat excess bone decay. However, it is still a major health concern and the message is clear. To invest early in bone health before it's too late. Okay, so some quick highlights about osteoporosis. You want to watch out for it in women over 50. Uh, periosteum creation starts to slow down with the lack of estrogen and progesterone in the body. You get loss of normal bone density, so it's not as thick, which means it's not as strong. An increased bone porosity, meaning it becomes porous. There's a bunch of holes in it now, and that becomes a fracture risk. Just, ooh, you know, I'm washing the dishes, I sneeze, and suddenly I break my back. Now, you can get pathologic fractures, which are broken bones caused by disease, not injury. And then there's also osteopenia, which is lower than normal bone density, but it's not actual full-blown osteoporosis yet. You will see bone deformities, um, such as abnormal spine curvatures. So we're going back to scoliosis, hyperkyphosis, which is the dowager's hump. And you'll even see loss of height, which is fairly common in extremely geriatric women in particular, but also men. Um, you will actually see a gradual decrease in their total height. All right, so you are going to massage someone with osteoporosis. What do you do? Obviously position them for comfort just like any other client, although it may look a little bit different depending on where they have weakness, especially in the hips and in the thoracic spine. These are key areas to watch out for. Again, hyperkyphosis is very common, so the same steps that you would take for anyone else with hyperkyphosis. You will not use deep pressure around any of the skeletal system, but really just anywhere, um, because you want to reduce that fracture risk. You do not want to be massaging someone and suddenly have something in their uh, hip or shol shoulder girdle break, or, you know, my goodness, break off a spinous process. It's going to be bad for everybody. You can use gentle, passive range of motion to affected areas. This also makes me nervous as a therapist personally. Um, your book suggests it. They do need to get movement for sure. But I would double check the extent of the osteoporosis if your client is aware of it, if they've had bone density tests or x-rays done, and you need to make very, very sure that you are not overworking the spine, the hips, and the wrists most especially uh, when you're doing this passive range of motion. In this particular case, those will be endangerment sites on this type of client. Today's topic is fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a medical condition characterized by a widespread pain in the muscles and bones, accompanied by fatigue, sleep, memory, and mood issues. Most people who suffer from fibromyalgia are women. However, men and children also can be affected by the disorder. Fibromyalgia is a chronic long-term disorder and is due to the abnormalities in how the central nervous system 
processes pain signals. People with fibromyalgia have a heightened sense of pain, sometimes described as muscle ache. The condition isn't a progressive disorder, meaning it won't steadily worsen over time. Many people who suffer from fibromyalgia also have irritable bowel syndrome, anxiety, tension, headache, and depression. The pain and sleeplessness associated with the disorder can interfere with the ability of the sufferer to function at home or on their job. According to the National Fibromyalgia Association, the disorder affects about 3 to 6 percent of the world's population. Causes The exact cause of fibromyalgia is unknown. Researchers are close to understanding factors that may work together to cause it. Researchers believe that the condition is related to an abnormal increase in levels of certain chemicals in the brain that signal pain. This changes the way in which the central nervous system processes pain messages transmitted around the body. In many cases, the condition is triggered by a variety of factors working together. These may include an infection, genetics, physical or emotional trauma such as a repetitive injury to the body caused by performing the same action over and over again, the death of a loved one, breakdown of a relationship, car accident, a person suffering from osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus may be more likely to develop fibromyalgia. Symptoms An increased sensitivity to pain Fatigue Widespread pain occurring on both sides of the body and above and below the waist Difficulty sleeping Headaches Muscle stiffness Problems with memory and concentration commonly referred to as fibrofog, irritable bowel syndrome, restless leg syndrome, tingling and numbness in the feet and hands, sensitivity to cold or heat, sensitivity to noise or lights. Diagnosis and treatment. There is no single test that can fully diagnose fibromyalgia. A diagnosis can be made if a person has experienced widespread pain for three months or longer with no identifiable underlying medical condition related to the pain. Other conditions with similar symptoms may be ruled out by blood tests. Blood tests may include complete blood count, rheumatoid function, thyroid function tests, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, treatment. Although there is presently no cure for the disorder, treatment options are available to help relieve symptoms and make the condition easier to live with. The video explained fibromyalgia syndrome pretty well. I just want to reiterate that clients with fibromyalgia do have periods of exacerbation and remission. They might be sensitive one day that they want to come into the office and they may be in complete remission one day. So you will be adjusting your massage modality and protocols each and every time you see this client will be different. And again, they have a lower pressure pain threshold. Poking your fingertips, knuckles, anything that seems sharp or angular will be especially painful for these types of clients. I would highly suggest using broad pressure, compression, some myofascial, uh, stretching if you want to do some deeper work, but you need to do minimum applied sharp directional force, which absolutely will induce pain. In some cases, even the compression will induce pain and you will need to do very, very light techniques. You will need to be in constant verbal communication with your client as well as watching out for pain signals if it is a client that might feel self-conscious about asking you to let up on the pressure. Again, just tailor the massage to how they're feeling. Use light pressure. Gradual increases from session to session is what your book suggests. However, 
it's really up to the client and if they're in a remission stage or not what your pressure does it doesn't matter if it's your fifth session and now you're going deeper than you did on the fourth third and second sessions because if they are getting a slight exacerbation stage on that fifth session you need to go back to the very beginning low light pressure so i would gradually increase during the session itself and start each subsequent session afterwards as a brand new experience as with everything else factor in coexisting conditions that they might have um, ra is for rheumatoid arthritis of course lupus which is an autoimmune disorder tmd here instead of tmjd which is temporomandibular disorder or temporal mandibular joint disorder please watch out for these types of coexisting conditions that have separate pain protocols attached to them next up is headaches headaches are so terribly common of course there are a multitude of causes for headaches um, one of the most common of which is honestly dehydration but it, for the purpose of the massage office, we're going to talk about tension headaches, which come in a band-like bilateral pattern with non-throbbing pain. It is like a tight band around the head. It is constant and does not seem to worsen during activity. Migraines, your book states, is moderate to severe pain, described as pounding, pulsing, or throbbing. Um, but migraines are extremely intense absolutely debilitating in some cases there can be nausea and vomiting sensitivity to light is an understatement in some cases of migraine the light can feel absolutely blinding you may be unable to keep your eyes open in a normally lit room smells can make you intensely nauseous or worsen the headache and of course different types of sounds can worsen the headache as well you also want to watch out for temperature sensitivity with migraines. Very often, cold will help reduce the pain of the migraine. There are also cluster headaches, which occur in cluster periods from two weeks to three months. They will usually start in the eye area on one side, and it can feel like burning and stabbing pain, or it can be throbbing, almost like a heartbeat or it can just be a consistent pain that stays for a couple of hours, goes away, and then comes back again for this two week to three month period. All right, so massage and tension headaches. What do you do? Your book suggests you using passive range of motion to improve treatment outcomes. I don't know. I do like to stretch the neck gently from side to side. I really don't recommend any type of rotation of the cervical spine, just those gentle side to side stretches. Now you absolutely do want to treat the soft tissues of the scalp, the suboccipitals, the posterior neck and the shoulders. This is a case where I highly recommend doing a little bit deeper work on the forehead. Uh, just firm finger pressure, please. No strange depotament. That will make the headache worse. But you're going to want to work on the frontalis muscle and you're going to want to work on the occipitalis. Of course, those two meet in what's called the galea aponeurotica, which is a very dense fibrous connective tissue that connects the front of your head to the back of your head and it makes up the majority of your scalp tissue. The best way for clients that like this type of work, and this is again an instance where you need enthusiastic consent in order to do this technique, but hair pulling in large sections, you never want to pull just a few hairs, hair pulling can be highly effective in not only bringing some fluid to this aponeurotica region, but also releasing the tension headache itself. Talking about the suboccipitals needing to be worked, this definitely brings us to massage modalities and migraine and cluster headaches. 
Some people say that you should postpone until the headache subsides. I have met many, many clients with chronic migraines that were coming either from a temporal mandibular issue or it was coming from very contracted suboccipitals. And in this case, I have actually worked on clients in the midst of a headache. If a migraine is in full force, it could actually make it difficult for them to drive. Um, I have had to cancel massages because a migraine has been simply too much to even make it to the session. But if it is someone that suffers from these chronically, it may be extremely difficult to avoid a session when a headache is either starting or subsiding. Um, treat soft tissues of the scalp again, the posterior neck for sure, these muscles will be contracted heavily, and the shoulders. Moderate to deep pressure, absolutely. I love to use trigger point therapy in the suboccipital region. A lot of people do utilize reflexology if they cannot work in these regions directly due to pain that the client is currently undergoing. So we can get at it from a secondary place on the body. Um, your book recommends passive range of motion to improve outcomes. And again, this is another case where I will do passive range of motion laterally. Um, on both sides, so bilaterally on the neck, but I would not do any rotation. I would not do a lot of flexion or extension other than gentle pulling with my hand pressure only. Okay, so this next section is like tigers and lions and bears, oh my, but it is bunions, hammer toes, and mallet toes, oh my. Bunions are the medial displacement and enlargement of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So it's where your metatarsal muscle, or excuse me, your bones and the phalangeal bone where, these t where this joint combines your big toe to your foot and it can enlarge that joint and it will extend out medially. And this can also occur on the joint of the small toe, which will push out that joint between the toe and the foot laterally. It'll spread outwards. Hammer toes are abnormal extensions of the joint um, with abnormal flexion. And this usually occurs in either the second, third, and fourth toe, so right in the middle of the foot. Um, you will see some people with an extreme hammer toe when they go to put on shoes. Very often that toe can just sneak out and over the front of a shoe or a sandal strap and it can be pretty funny. Mallet toes are an abnormal flexion of the joint, usually in the second toe. And these next few videos will give you some visuals on what that looks like in the skeletal system and how it appears on the foot itself. This foot shows you what a bunion looks like underneath the surface. Now a bunion can occur from wearing tight shoes that put pressure on the toes up here and cause this bone to sort of stick out and bulge and get more bone formation to happen here. It can also be genetic. And it can also happen just based on the anatomy of your foot that causes these bones to get displaced and for extra pressure to happen here at the, at the big toe. And today we're going to talk about claw toes and hammer toes and mallet toes. Very common disorder in the forefoot and uh, sometimes that language gets mixed up or people don't really know the difference in the claw toe and the hammer toe. So let's kind of go over that, okay? So we start with the mallet toe. The mallet toe is where the distal toe bends down. So think of it like a hammer toe, but really it's a different joint. So the distal toe bends down. How do we treat that? If it gets bad, you can straighten it out surgically, but it's not an overly common disorder. Next we talk about hammer toes. It's more what we call the PIP or proximal interphalangeal joint. Much more common disorder where you have this bending of the toe at this joint, more the proximal joint of the toe. And that can be a more common disorder that people complain about. There's no a conservative treatment for that. You can try digital pads or, to cover that area, but to really treat it, you have to do that surgically. And the way we do that is just remove that joint and pin it straight. And then the final thing is the claw toe. 
Nicolto is actually a combination of all of these things. It's actually a pulling up of the toe at the base of the toe and a bending of the toe where the hammer toe is. So it actually combines several things within the toe. And again, that's a little bit more serious diagnosis. Again, it doesn't do well with conservative treatment. If it bothers you enough, we tend to do that surgery. And the only thing we add to the hammer toe surgery by taking out that joint, we also have to go back at the base of the toe and generally release the capsule and release the tendons and then again pin it. And usually that works quite well. Nobody's That's a hammer toe deformity. I could fix this. I'm a reconstructive foot and ankle Nobody's surgeon. No know. need to paint the top of your toe anymore. Come to Beverly Hills. Let's fix know? this. All right. So when massaging bunions, hammer toes and mallet toes, ask if they're sensitive. They might want it rubbed. They might have coexisting conditions like arthritis, um, gout sometimes uh, with the bunion. So be very careful about that. Address your pressure accordingly. You're definitely going to want to massage the surrounding areas of the feet and the lower leg with the affected muscles. Um, but you do want to avoid traction and passive range of motion on the affected joints. Um, you're not going to know how stable they are or if there are any other coexisting conditions that the client themselves may not be aware of. This brings us into additional feet issues in part two of the musculoskeletal pathologies and disorders. This brings us to pes planus, reduced or collapsed medial longitudinal arch causing medial border of foot to contact the ground when standing. It actually collapses your entire foot medially, which affects your ankle joint and travels upwards through the knees and the hips. This is a fancy way of saying flat foot. The next one is pes cavus or cavus, potato potato. It means excessively raised medial and longitudinal lateral arches. It basically means you have an exceptionally high arch. You know those expensive running shoes with a high arch that are painful with everyone for normal feet and flat feet? These people think that this arch is not high enough. This next slide here shows you some very interesting differences between the footprints of people with pes cavus and pes planus. When massaging a client with either of these conditions, you are absolutely going to want to pay attention to the lower leg muscles to reduce tension in those areas. And you need to inquire about sensitivity over the affected areas and of course, adjust your pressure accordingly. Sometimes these issues can lead to plantar fasciitis, which we are covering next. The plantar fascia is a structure made of connective tissue on the sole of the foot. It supports the arch of the foot and plays an important role in the mechanics of walking. When the foot is in a position known as plantar flexion, which means that the toes are pointed down like a ballerina, the plantar fascia is under less tension. When the foot is pulled up in dorsiflexion, the plantar fascia tightens up under tension. Sometimes the plantar fascia becomes irritated and inflamed at the site where it attaches to the heel bone, the calcaneus. This is a condition known as plantar fasciitis. While sleeping, the foot usually rests in plantar flexion. Upon taking the first step after getting out of bed, the plantar fascia is rapidly stretched. This places extra tension at the attachment of the plantar fascia to the calcaneus. If the plantar fascia is inflamed, this can be very painful. And so plantar fasciitis often causes the most severe pain upon getting out of bed in the morning or standing after sitting for a long period of time. For people who suffer from plantar fasciitis, it is important to gently stretch the plantar fascia before standing and walking each morning. 
All right, massage and plantar fasciitis. Obviously, this is an acute inflammation issue, then it's going to be a local contraindication. You're going to elevate the area if possible during the massage and let that foot relax. If it's subacute, there's no acute inflammation, they can receive local massage. Compression usually feels good. Transverse friction or cross fiber friction. Um, sustained myofascial release and some gentle passive dorsiflexion and pan plantar flexion. So you're moving that foot forwards and backwards and bending some of that arch area a little bit. There are some amazing stretches and bodywork techniques. This is definitely something that you can become certified in. It affects millions of people for a variety of reasons. Um, obesity, uh, positional issues, especially people sitting down on a computer for a job. There are a multitude of ways that someone can develop plantar fasciitis. And it is something that you can get a couple of times in your life. Physical therapists work on it. As a massage therapist, you definitely can specialize in some of the techniques to stretch this area and work on it effectively and have it become a specialty. Hit pause and take a breather if you need to. I know that this is a long lecture this week for chapter five, but now we're going to delve into joint disorders, the spondylolithesis and spondylosis gangliosis, baker cysts, bursitis, and temporomandibular disorders are all next uh, in this portion of the lecture. I may do a couple videos on this, but first let's define the terms. Spondylosis. When you hear spondylosis, think general term for arthritic changes in the spine, whether that's joint degeneration, loss of joint space, sclerosis, disc bulging, things of that nature. It's just a general term. So spondylolisthesis is when there is a displacement of one vertebra over relative to the one below. So if this one is shifted forward, that would be a spondylolisthesis. Now there's different causes of that. One of the causes is a traumatic event, a spondylolysis. That is where there is a fracture in the pars interarticularis, which is sort of a bridge between the facets the joints back here and the vertebra. This is important, especially in adolescence. We see this in young athletes, active gymnasts, overhead extension activities. Spondylolithesis. So your vertebrae has slipped forward. It has gone in an anterior direction. Usually this affects lumbar vertebrae number four or L5. It does have four different grades of displacement um, going from bad to worse. A lot of times it will be low grade, fairly stable, and for the most part asymptomatic. It's not until grade three or four that you start seeing nerve impingement and possible coexisting issues with this particular disorder. Spondylolysis is a fracture in pars interarticularis. So it's between the superior and inferior articular facets of the spine. Uh, some people do describe it as a Scotty dog where the nose is in the transverse process. The front legs are the inferior articular facets and it looks like a decapitated spotty dog. So basically what has happened is that the entire head has broken off of the spine. Um, this can be particularly painful. You do have nerve receptors in the periosteum of the bone. In this case, you are going to want to position the client for comfort. Um, just like hyperlidosis uh, for spondylolithesis, you're going to want to put the bolsters behind the knees when supine, maybe the pillow under the abdomen when prone. A lot of times hyperlidosis can actually lead to spondylolithesis. Um, so be aware of those coexisting conditions, which also includes arthritis, osteoarthritis, and a variety of pain issues. 
you're only going to use light pressure on the lumbosacral region. There's impingement there most likely. There's definitely going to be some tense areas in that section that are also impinging on the nerves, which are going in and about all of that soft tissue that is inflamed. You will avoid traction and passive range of motion on the lumbar spine. This is obviously an area aching to be stretched, but you are not aware of how bad their condition is, if they also have osteoporosis or something else. So you will not do any deep work or compression until you know these particulars. These deep stretching maneuvers will cause traction, which can be an excellent stretch for most clients, but very dangerous on those with spondylolisthesis. Now we are going to the exciting world of ganglion cysts, which are a fluid-filled pouch on tendons or joints, usually in the wrist or hand. They can be pea-sized or they can be up to an inch in diameter. Uh, fun fact, I used to do 8 to 12 60-minute deep tissue massages a day. Um, I don't want to say how many years ago, but... I was young and fresh and ready to go, and I managed to give myself a ganglion cyst almost identical to the one in this photograph. I did massage it myself um, and did manage to pop it, which felt like a grape exploding under the skin. That is after having it medically examined and making sure that that's what this is. You, as a massage therapist working on a client, are going to avoid the affected area and not be like your instructor because the pressure may cause the cyst to rupture or you could cause radial nerve damage depending on where this cyst is actually sitting. Mine was in a safe place. I was given medical clearance. They offered to give me outpatient surgery to drain it and I was young and dumb and decided to massage and pop it myself, which it did. You do not want this to pop for your client during the massage. So our next one is the Baker Cyst. It is not delicious like a donut. It is a fluid filled pouch in the popliteal space behind the knee you could get thrombophlebitis or a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, as a complication of a Baker's cyst. This is usually fairly evident in those who are not morbidly obese. It may be a little bit more difficult to detect under a thicker layer of adipose tissue. When massaging someone with a Baker cyst, you need to screen for deep vein thrombosis, any type of uh, unilateral leg swelling is a sign and symptom, heat, redness, pain. Uh, if there is a DVT, you are going to avoid that leg entirely. If there is not a DVT, then you are going to avoid the entire posterior knee area. Um, you can definitely use a soft bolster behind the knees when they are supine so that that cyst is not pressing directly on the table and they're not overextending their leg at that knee joint. You do need to make sure that you, again, factor in coexisting conditions like osteoarthritis, which we put in our soap notes as OA, any other type of knee injuries, any type of torsion caused pain um, in the ligaments or in the tendons. And in general, just really, really avoid that knee. Here's what a bursa is and what bursitis means. Bursa are these little fluid-filled sacs, like highlighted here, and they're located on the edges of bone, whether on your hip, your elbow, or all around your body. Their function is to serve as a buffer. So the muscles and tendons, as we contract and stretch the muscles, will move over that region, and the bursa prevents the muscles and tendons from just grating on the bone. But the bursa themselves can get inflamed and irritated, called bursitis, and that can lead to pain. 
Okay, so we have seen the video of what a bursa is. What is bursitis? That is the inflammation of a bursa. It can be acute. It can be chronic. The most common locations are on the shoulder, the elbows, the knees, absolutely. The heels and the base of the great toe. All right, with massage and bursitis, it is a local contraindication. You are going to avoid sideline positions if it is in the hip areas for sure. If it is in the toe when they are laying prone, you're going to use a bolster at the ankle joint to prevent the toe touching the table. You are going to undrape the foot when they are laying supine to prevent pressure on the toe with the sheet tugging on it. You will massage the muscles that cross the affected joints, are the antagonist to, are synergist to, as long as you are not directly tugging on or massaging the area around the bursitis itself or on the lower portion of the muscle that is actually crossing the inflamed bursa. Neuromuscular dentistry focuses on the relationship among the teeth, jaw muscles, and jaw joints. In a harmonious bite, the muscles on both sides of the face are relaxed when you are not chewing or swallowing. When you do chew or swallow, these muscles should contract evenly to bring the teeth together at the same time all around the mouth. But when there's a problem with the bite, your teeth don't hit correctly, which causes the muscles to use extra force and the jaw joints to shift position in order to bring the teeth together. And when you are not chewing, your jaw muscles may not fully relax, even though they feel normal to you. This can cause the muscles and joints to become sore, tired, and stiff. It can also lead to headaches, damage to the teeth or jaw joint, and other symptoms. When Temporomandibular disorder, TMD, also sometimes referred to as TMJD, and also for old school dentists and chiropractors, just TMJ. <clears throat> this stands for the temporomandibular joint which has a disorder that can cause bruxism, which is teeth clenching or grinding. Sometimes this happens at night. It's called night grinding. And also crepitus, which is the clicking, popping, and grating sounds heard when moving the jaw, chewing, yawning. It sounds like there are things crinkling and crackling in there sometimes. So there is myogenic TMD, which means it's only the muscles and the soft tissues. You'll see this in the masseter, the temporalis muscle, sometimes the pterygoids. Uh, for those you need to do inner oral work, you need to don on a pair of gloves and work inside the mouth to effectively get to the pterygoid muscles. Um, it can occur with people with myofascial disorders. Um, whiplash is a common um, instigator of TMD. And there's also articular issues. These are joint related. There's an abnormal relationship between the articular discs and the condyle. <clears throat> Sometimes your teeth do not line up. Sometimes there is an issue with the position of the jawbone itself. And this is an articular type of TMD. When massaging someone with TMD, you're going to avoid a prone position if it causes a lot of pain. Sometimes being face down on the face cradle can put a lot of pressure on those joints and turning the head from side to side, especially if there's any associated neck pain or temporalis pain is going to cause some issues. So you may want to do side lying if they're tolerant of that, but mostly in the supine position. In a myogenic case, you can absolutely massage the temporalis um, and the masseter muscles. Uh, if you do the masseter intraorally, obviously this requires gloves. That's the only way that you're going to get to the pterygoids as well. Um, I personally love to do neuromuscular techniques and trigger point on the masseter seems to be extremely effective. Again, this is another type of massage that you can specialize in. I did, this is one of my favorite uh, things to work on for clients that have some type of pain disorder. 
You're also going to want to massage the neck and the shoulder muscles and end with a few relaxing techniques. Uh, since a lot of TMD cases actually are stress related, I would like to add here, you usually wouldn't use a lot of heat because with this pain, there is inflammation. It's kind of hard to tell that it is inflamed because it is such a small area, but ice is usually very effective and not only numbing the area, but causing some of that vasoconstriction and getting that inflammation to go down, allowing you to do a little bit of deeper work. Okay, so now we're going to discuss epicondylitis. It's an inflammation at the epicondyle. Lateral epicondylitis, known as tennis elbow, is the inflammation of common extensor tendons at the lateral epicondyle. Medial epicondylitis, golfer's elbow, is inflammation of common flexor tendons at the medial epicondyle. A lot of times these are treated by putting a pressure band around the arm, which takes some of the tension off of the epicondyle itself as the tendons are pulling at the site where there could be micro tears or inflammation. This usually lasts for a couple of weeks and massage is highly indicated. Some other issues that we run into with tendons pathology that are acute or chronic conditions involving the tendons, the sheaths, or attachment sites of the tendons. Um, they are caused by inflammation, usually by repetitive motion or trauma or degeneration as such as aging. So there's tendonitis, which is one of the most common ones, which is the inflammation of the tendon. All right, and tendinosis, which is the degeneration of the tendon. It's often mislabeled as tendinitis, um, but there is no inflammation present in tendinosis. It is just wearing away. As always, if there is acute inflammation, it's a local contraindication. You can always elevate the area if possible during massage. But if there is no inflammation, it is subacute, you can receive local massage. Friction massage can promote tendon healing and reduce pain and improve function, uh, especially when combined with like trigger point massage, one of my favorites, myofascial release techniques, another favorite, passive range of motion, uh, physical therapy, which you will not be doing, and home care, which you can mildly make suggestions. Just please make sure to stay within your scope of practice. There are various forms of arthritis, which is typically very painful for the joint. It is an inflammation in the joint. There's also osteoarthritis. Uh, right now we're going to talk about gout, which is arthritis caused by the accumulation of uric acid crystals. Um, usually at the base of the great toe, it can travel up the leg. It causes pain and tenderness, uh, swelling, redness. It can cause a fever. There are nodules that can form in subcutaneous issues. They feel like crystallized lipomas almost, and usually those are painless. All right, massage and gout. Do we ever massage people with a fever? No, we don't. That's an absolute contraindication. So the massage is postponed if the client has a fever. You're going to avoid the entire affected area and the nodules. You are not going to rub them like lipomas. That is not what they are. When the client is prone, you're going to use a bolster underneath the ankles to help keep the joint, the big toe from touching the table and the affected area. And while supine, as with any other foot issues, you're going to undrape the foot to prevent uncomfortable pressure from the sheet tugging on the toe. Um, in this instance, when we think about coexisting conditions, kidney dysfunction is very likely. And some severe kidney dysfunctions could be an absolute contraindication. So make sure that you talk to your client in detail during the intake about what their body can handle in terms of circulation, um, you know, effleurage may be a contraindication in this case for a full body massage. You really want to make sure that the rest of their body is in good health if they have gout before performing any type of manual therapy. Shin splints, otherwise known as medial tibial stress syndrome, 
MTSS, everyone calls them shin splints to my knowledge, is pain along the medial tibia, all right, on the inside border of the tibia. It's often bilateral. You very rarely see it in only one leg or the other. It's pretty common in people who are participating in sports um, in terms of running and jumping, um, stress-heavy leg exercises. An example would be runners and dancers and military recruits. So during basic training, you can see a lot of shin splints occurring. If someone decides to be a weekend warrior and go crazy and run a marathon, you may see shin splints um, occur after a couple of days. Usually when someone starts a new exercise program or they suddenly increase the effort that they're putting into a running or some type of leg exercises, within those first few weeks, you will most likely see shin, shin splints occur. When performing a massage with someone on shin splints, if they have acute inflammation, of course, it's a local contraindication. Um, if there is no inflammation, they can use local massage. Um, compression is okay. I've never used transverse friction myself, even though the book is suggesting this. Obviously, if the patient enjoys it, and it is, but if this is fairly recent, I would not. If it has been a chronic issue that is now resolving, absolutely. Um, sustained myofascial release, yes. Uh, stretching in these long pressured compression stretches are absolutely amazing. And gentle passive dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot can certainly help stretch out those muscles of the lower legs uh, without the client doing anything to activate them. Ice massage is great. It may reduce the pain um, and possibly reduce the recovery time. I wouldn't necessarily recommend heat therapy on this because we do not want to cause more inflammation in the area. A stiff, painful shoulder could mean you have a frozen shoulder. The scientific name that we give it is adhesive capsulitis. And basically it's a condition when the shoulder gets tight and you can't move it very well. Dr. Christopher Camp says frozen shoulder happens when the lining that goes around the shoulder joint gets inflamed, possibly the result of a small injury. It thickens over time, forming scar tissue. Frozen shoulder kind of exists in three stages. And the symptoms and treatment options depend on which stage you're in. So the first one is an inflammatory stage. That's the painful stage. Rest and steroid injections may help. The second stage is when the shoulder is less painful but starts to stiffen. Physical therapy works well then. The third phase is what we call thawing, which means it finally starts to relax, loosen out, loosen up and gain motion back again. If it doesn't resolve in 6 to 12 months, surgery may be an option. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Dee Dee Stephen. All right, now we're going to talk about the stages of adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, which is freezing. That's the gradual onset of the shoulder ache and stiffness. This can last for six weeks to nine months as the shoulder stiffness slowly increases, reducing range of motion. Uh, this actually happened to my dad, lifting the lid to a dumpster with his right arm and then it gets frozen. The pain starts to lessen, but the shoulder remains stiff and the movement's difficult. Uh, this occurs over a period of two to six months and then thawing, the recovery, the pain lessens and range of motion slowly improves. This process can take over a year. So massaging someone with frozen shoulder um, can be applied at any area at any stage of it. Even during the pain stage, you can begin trying to loosen the joint and relax those muscles. Friction massage can help reduce the pain and improve mobility. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, it's breaking up adhesions. You're doing a little bit of work to bring some inflammation and some healing into that area. Doing that passive range of motion can certainly help get some movability back into that joint. And you can use the pendulum method, which I have on the next slide for you. 
So the shoulder passive range of motion and traction technique called the pendulum method is where a client lies prone near the edge of the massage table and the affected arm hangs over the edge. And then you gently swing their arm like a pendulum for 30 seconds. And then you can let them rest in this position for up to five minutes. And the client can then also actively gently swing the arm during this time to help promote movement and freeing the joint. Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. You're here at Caring Medical Florida. One of the common conditions that we see at the office here is cervical torticollis. A lot of people don't realize when there's spasms of the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the person tends to want to move their head in a certain direction because the various muscles are in spasm that it's caused by upper cervical or cervical instability impairing the function of the spinal accessory nerve. The spinal accessory nerve, which is cranial nerve 11, actually innervates the sternocleidomastoid muscle, that's this big muscle here, and the trapezius. That nerve runs in the carotid sheath with the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve along with the carotid artery. When a person has cervical instability, uh, that cervical instability, because of the changes in the cervical curve, along with excessive motion of the vertebrae, it can actually stretch and compress the spinal accessory nerve. Once it does that, the nerve impulse to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle isn't correct. It can either be too much or too little, but what happens is the muscles go into spasm. So if anybody is having tightness, like in the trapezius, especially on one side, or the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which turns the head, on, if it's uh, painful, tender, tight on one side, they should consider about getting a digital motion x-ray because that's how we document cervical instability. In most cases of cervical torticollis, especially if it's early, all the person needs is to get the cervical spine stabilized with prolotherapy. Once the cervical spine is stabilized, the nerve impulses to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and trapezius muscle, which cause uh, spastic torticollis, they, they get normal, the muscles relax, and the condition is cured. So you definitely can get cured of spastic cervical torticollis with prolotherapy. Okay guys, this is the last one for this lecture and this is gonna be torticollis, the cervical or spasmodic dystonia. It's basically spasms of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the SCM on the side of your neck, which is responsible for turning the head and tilting to one side, all right? You can have a congenital muscular episode of torticollis, which occurs um, during a birth trauma, um, or something that occurs during infancy. This is really rare. There are tons of interesting uh, treatment videos out there about this. Another one is spasmatic torticollis, which occurs after an injury or repetitive motion. Uh, or if you're my age, just sleeping incorrectly, a slight breeze coming in through the window, the air conditioner on wrong, you name it, it could cause it to spasm. It's also called acquired torticollis. Some people uh, call it positional torticollis. Some people call it wry neck. Massaging someone with torticollis can be tricky. Um, if there's acute inflammation, it's a local contraindication. Um, if it's not inflamed, you can receive local massage, but obviously they're still going to be in pain. You're going to try to position them for comfort, which might mean that they need to lay um, either sideline or supine the entire time. But in my opinion, treating them while they're supine is the absolute best position uh, to do so at any rate. Massaging the posterior neck muscles and SCM attachment sites. 
Um, do not massage the anterior neck. This is an endangerment site. I would also caution when massaging the SCM that you're very careful about the carotid artery and other areas. We do not want to disrupt any plaque that might be in this area and cause our client to have a heart attack. When doing some passive range of motion or some gentle flexion, you need to avoid overstretching the injured area. All right, remember these muscle spindles react to uh, being stretched very quickly and might spasm back because they don't want an injury to occur to the area. So if you pull the neck too hard to the opposite side of where this neck is hurting, uh, you could cause another pain spasm pain cycle, which we will discuss in another chapter. Congratulations, you have managed to make it to the end of this lecture. Sorry, it's running a little long, close to an hour and 18 minutes. Um, but I hope that you learned something new today. And of course, if you want to check out any of these videos in full, these are the uh, URL links uh, for full credit to where I have pulled them from. Again, if you have any questions, please contact me. Please look at your full length PowerPoint and browse through the chapter of your book to help you with all of this week's quizzes.